Happy October, everybody, and welcome back to another review marathon here on Thumb Together. It's me, your old confidant, Andrew Fantasia. Welcome aboard. Uh, please be sure to do all the YouTube stuff like liking and subscribing and clicking bells and whatnot. And hey, if you think I'm okay, don't forget to check out my fantasy novel, We Were Wizards, which is available now on Amazon in ebook and paperback and hardcover. And since this is part of a series, I didn't waste any time. You can also get the next book in the series also on Amazon and also in all three of those formats. Seekers of the Stones, Ghosts of Wizards Past. For the fantasy fan in your life, check out We Were Wizards. Anyway, it is a new fiscal quarter here, and though we don't care so much about the fiscal part in these parts, we do care about the quarter because it's a review marathon, and if you are new to these, welcome aboard. Here's how they work. Every three months I come back here and I see how many movies I can watch in those three months that are A, older than a year, and B, movies I have never completely watched before. I get to expand my fan base repertoire and open myself up to all kinds of new cinematic experiences, and then I get to come here and talk about it with you fine people and do it in a fun, crazy, fast-paced way to boot. This is the 11th review marathon. Uh, we've already done 11 of these, can you believe it? Uh, I have some fun ideas now that we have such a big growing collection of movies that I've got under my belt here, uh, but we'll talk about those after the review marathon. But regardless, what's the total today? How many did I watch between July and September? The grand total is 32. It's a nice number. I like that. I like when I end up in the 30s. When I end up in the 20s, I'm like, ah, okay, fine. But when I end up in the 30s, that makes me happy. 32 movies we're going to be talking about today on Review Marathon 11. And I found that this particular time, in these three months, I don't know what it was, but those 32 movies I watched, a lot of them were great. More so than usual. Usually on these marathons, I get a mixed bag. That's kind of how it goes. Here, you're still getting a mixed bag, but a lot of these movies were really, really good. So much so that I've already bought one of them because I loved it so much. Let's get to it. Here we go. It's time for the marathon. 32 movies as fast as we can. Let's get started. Cat O Nine Tales, another slick murder mystery from Dario Argento. While I still prefer Profondo Rosso, Cat O Nine Tales delivers all the sexy thrills I've come to expect from Italy's answer to Hitchcock. The heroes, a newspaper reporter and a blind man who enjoys puzzles, make an odd but interesting pair, and they're such likable dudes that it's easy to get swept along on their crusade. Good stuff. Death Ship. I could tell that this bizarre horror film was Canadian because of three telltale clues. One of the cast members mentions the city of Toronto, another one says washroom instead of bathroom, and the whole production was of poor quality. Essentially, a cruise ship sinks and its survivors find themselves on a Nazi ghost ship where the phantoms of Gestapo's past make their lives a living hell. Great concept, but pretty crummy execution. Dressed to Kill. This is not the Brian De Palma film, but rather the 1947 Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes flick, the last of 14 in which Rathbone played the famous detective. Since I didn't know this ahead of time, this makes it one of the ultra-rare instances where I watched a sequel before seeing the original. But more on that later. They set it in what was then contemporary times, and apparently that caused some controversy amongst Sherlock Holmes fans who insisted that his adventures should be limited to the Victorian era. Since I've had the pleasure of seeing Holmes in so many formats now, I really couldn't have cared less. Plus, the plot was about music boxes, so that was kind of groovy. Fist of Fury. A Bruce Lee classic I've owned for a while, but held off on watching for no particular reason. It's more competently made and much better acted than The Big Boss, with Bruce donning a few fun disguises as he exacts his revenge on a rival Japanese martial arts school. Plus, you get to see Bruce's nunchucks at their most nunchucky. God, I wish this man had lived a full life. R.I.P. Mr. Lee. Gator Bait. I'm not gonna say that Gator Bait will change your life. It's just a low-budget 70s revenge flick set in the mucky swamps of the Louisiana Bayou. Sounds like throwaway trash at first, sure, but it's actually very well acted, competently directed, and skillfully written. You know something? It's not just skillfully written. I'm even going to take it a step further. With a plot that revolves around murder, vengeance, and feuding families, Gator Bait is Hillbilly Shakespeare. And you can quote me on that. The Grand Budapest Hotel. 
Up until this point, The Life Aquatic was the only Wes Anderson movie I've been privy to, but Grand Budapest looked like a lot of fun, so I checked it out. I've always had a fondness for stories set during this era in Central or Eastern Europe, which I've just learned are called Ruritanian romances. Fun fact. With that as the backdrop, I had a lot of fun watching this tapestry unfold. The visuals were outstanding and the world building had more layers than an onion in Christopher Nolan's pantry, but I will admit, I haven't yet acquired the Wes Anderson taste. I'm curious to see his other work, but I'm going to pace myself. There's only so much symmetrical deadpan I can take in one sitting. The Guns of Navarone. The 1960s really knew how to spin a good World War II tale. Case in point is The Guns of Navarone, a Gregory Peck-led adventure about a small team trying to sneak behind Axis lines to destroy two giant Nazi guns guarding a critical waterway on the Greek island of Navarone. Everything from the larger-than-life weapons and vehicles to the impending hopelessness of their mission makes this feel like it was a big influence on Star Wars, Rogue One in particular. There's a shipwreck scene that goes on a bit too long, but other than that, this is a really swell picture. Force 10 from Navarone. A more lighthearted sequel with a totally unrelated premise. In fact, aside from some recap footage from part one in the prologue, this movie doesn't even feature the island of Navarone at all. It's definitely weaker than the first, but it's worth seeing for the cast alone. Where else can you get Carl Weathers, Robert Shaw, and Harrison Ford sharing the screen as your three leads? That's like a dream come true for me. The Hand. I never expected Oliver Stone to make a movie where a comic book artist loses his hand and then the hand allegedly crawls around and starts murdering people, and yet here we are. A bizarre film from a bizarre filmmaker held up completely on the shoulders of Michael Caine, who is giving it 100%. I would applaud, but his character can't. Harmontown. A very candid documentary about a very candid man, Harmontown is a documentary chronicling the misadventures of writer Dan Harmon. He gave us, among other things, Community and Rick and Morty. And just like Community, it's a sweet little tale about a man who is his own worst enemy, adrift in the sea of life, finding solace in the company of other lovable misfits. It's a great look behind the scenes at an artist, reminding us how bullshit the Hollywood studio system can be, and more importantly, how great art can touch so many lives. The Haunted Palace. One of my favorite Lovecraft stories, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, gets an adaptation at the hands of Roger Corman, Vincent Price, and Lon Chaney. While it sounds like a match made in heaven, the picture ended up leaving a wee bit to be desired. It just seems like nobody anywhere can adapt Lovecraft right. It's an overall great time, though. I liked it, but I feel like I would have liked it even more if I'd watched it during a spookier time of year than August. Hell High. What a weird movie. I thought I was going to get something along the lines of Class of 84, and I did, but in the worst possible way. This ended up being just sleazy 80s trash. A bunch of horrible people doing terrible things and then getting killed in unsatisfying ways. The dialogue is so laughably awful, it sounds like it was written 40 years earlier and nobody made any attempt to modernize it. Hobgoblins. My biggest takeaway from Hobgoblins is that the filmmakers weren't taking themselves seriously, and by God, I wish they were. Because if they were, this would have been added to the pantheon of legendary So Bad They're Good movies. I was not expecting to laugh as hard as I did here. Everybody needs to see Hobgoblins at least once, just for sheer giggles. I think I could watch the house party dance scene on a loop. And the final line had me genuinely applauding. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. God bless the 1970s. It's the only decade where your leading man could look like this and still be taken seriously. The Simpsons has paid homage to this classic sci-fi so many times that I owed it to myself to finally see it. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a fun, paranoid thriller that hits all the right beats. Though I will admit, I wish it was clearer about the rules of these pod people. You get replaced while you're asleep, but only if there's a pod nearby, but not too nearby, but sometimes not nearby at all. It's... Messy, but it still manages to deliver the chills, and even though I've known the final twist for years, it's still hella iconic. Kelly's Heroes. When you've got a star-studded cast like Telly Savalas, Carol O'Connor, Donald Sutherland, Clint Eastwood, and Harry Dean Stanton pulling a gold heist, you can pretty much take my money. It always leaves a funny taste in my mouth when World War II stories get mixed with comedy. While I wouldn't say the comedy in this works, I did end up enjoying the commentary Kelly's Heroes makes about how the military brass are lazy, ineffectual buffoons who constantly reap the rewards of their underlings' hard work. It had a very cool stick-it-to-the-man kind of feel. It was also strange to see such a blatant anachronism going on in a war film. Making Sutherland's character a long-haired hippie in 1945 was certainly a choice. I've really never seen anything else quite like it. The Mask of Zorro. I spent 25 years ignoring this because I thought it was going to be cheesy and super bland, but Dios mio, that was not the case. The Mask of Zorro is a great 90s blockbuster. 
tightly written and fun and charming and probably the best movie you could make about this 104-year-old character. The stunts were so damn good, and yet they serve as a bitter reminder that so much of modern stunt work is digital that it loses that tactile charm. The Mask of Zorro must have blown the doors off Cineplexes back in the day. I dig this a bunch. The Most Dangerous Game, aka Motomo Kiken na Yugi. This is a hard one to find, and it has nothing to do with the famous short story or its 1932 film adaptation. It's a 70s Japanese urban noir, and that right there sounds like a recipe for something I would love, but there was very little to love here. The main character is such an unbelievable piece of shit that I kept hoping somebody would kill him. This flick feels like it was written by a 14-year-old boy who was trying so desperately hard to be badass that you can't help but laugh at him. They could teach a masterclass on how not to write a male protagonist using this movie alone as its foundation. The New Kids The director of Friday the 13th has clearly learned nothing from Maniac Cop, he had Tom Atkins right there for all the world to enjoy, but then he killed him off so fast you'll miss him if you blink. For the rest of the movie, you're stuck with Lori Loughlin and her brother, who are the two most wholesome 80s teenagers ever put to film. For 90 minutes, you watch them build a really shitty amusement park and deal with a gang of psychotic bullies led by James Spader. I'll admit, I had fun. The two protagonists are so gosh darn lovable and sweet, I could have enjoyed watching them do anything. I just would have enjoyed it more if Tom Atkins was bopping around too. Night of the Demons in Night of the Demons, a bunch of teenagers sneak into an abandoned house for a Halloween party, and hilarious demon-filled hijinks ensue. Most of it is a dark, chaotic mess, but the first act's full of what is, in my opinion, precious cinematic gold. Lots of 1980s Halloween night goodness, complete with pumpkins, the crisp fall air, and those bastel wall decorations that every single human being had. Saving Mr. Banks since this is a film about a Disney movie produced in and of itself by the Walt Disney Company, I pressed play expecting to sit through two hours of shameless self-congratulatory pap. And while Saving Mr. Banks does revel in the magic and wonder of the Disney brand and the legacy of Mary Poppins, it's not about that, in the same way that P.L. Travers' stories aren't about the children being saved. This turned out to be a deeply emotional story about an artist using her art to overcome personal trauma. As an artist myself, I can't help but be sucked in by that, and it's all written, directed, and photographed splendidly. Saving Mr. Banks is excellent, and by the end, I was an emotional mess. 7. I know, I know, it's probably blasphemy that I haven't seen this until now. I saw parts of it on TV once in high school, but that was about it. And I like it. It's classic David Fincher, and it looks flippin' incredible for 1995. The choice of setting it in a nameless, bleak metropolis with constant rain gave it a very cool Gotham City-esque otherworldly feel. And Gotham is an apt comparison considering how influential Fincher's work was on The Batman. The Seven Deadly Sins killer is a spectacular villain, too. Kevin Spacey plays an evil man so well that, honestly, we should have seen it coming. The Sting. I was surprised by the fact that this was a period piece, but this 70s classic ended up charming me real fast, and before long I was swept up in its sprawling plot. I'm a dum-dum when it comes to financial stuff, so the intricacies of The Sting's more fiduciary plot points were a little lost on me at first, but by the end I think I got the gist of it. You can't go wrong with Redford, Newman, and Shaw leading the charge. Now, who wants to go bet on a horse race with me? The Strangers. This is one of the very, very, very rare instances where I watched a sequel before I watched the original, and I'm pretty sure that's only because, at the time, I didn't know that The Strangers Pray at Night was a sequel. But 2008's The Strangers finally fell on the old radar, and it turns out it's a genuinely engrossing, well-crafted, and terrifying bit of cinema. It plays on primal, realistic fears in all of us. It's dark, and it has an unhappy ending, and it sets the stage for sequels brilliantly. Suspiria. All I knew about Argento's most famous work was that it was supposed to be beautifully photographed and disturbing as hell. And its reputation was right on both counts. The blending of primary colors and shadows in Suspiria makes it look like nothing else, especially nothing made from the New Hollywood era onward. According to Wikipedia, it was one of the last films to ever be processed in Technicolor. And kids, if you don't know what Technicolor is, look it up. Seriously, it's kind of one of the most important things to happen to motion pictures. Anyway, this movie is about witchcraft. Isn't that neat? Suspiria, the 2018 remake. An American remake of a foreign horror film. 100% of the time, that's a recipe for absolute trash. Luckily, this modern retelling of Suspiria still maintains its giallo roots, thanks to Italian director Luca Guadagnino. While the original was a straight-up horror, 
This is more of an art house film with horror elements and a way heftier runtime. It's also got Tilda Swinton pulling a Mike Myers as she steps into three different roles under heavy makeup for no apparent reason other than to screw with the audience. There was a lot of cool, chilling stuff in here, but I think I prefer the straightforwardness of Argento's film. Train to Busan. Who has two thumbs and admittedly doesn't care for zombies? This guy. Who took a chance on Train to Busan anyway and found it worthy of the years of praise it's been getting, so much so that he's going to go ahead and say right now that it's one of the top five greatest zombie movies he's ever seen? Also this guy. Who still would rather see this genre go back to its supernatural roots so it can take us to some fun, unexpected places? And you get the idea. But seriously, Train to Busan is rad. True romance. You can tell right off the bat that this is a Tarantino script, and it feels a lot like his early stuff, Pulp Fiction in particular. It was well made and well acted and all that jazz, but it ended up being one of those movies where none of the characters were all that likable, and I didn't really care what happened to any of them at the end of the day. Christian Slater being a murderer who hears the voice of Elvis in his head has enough meat on it to fill a whole movie by itself, but they barely do anything with that concept. Fun to watch once, but I wouldn't go back. An Unmarried Woman I'm an easy lay for anything that takes place in New York City in the 70s. Unfortunately, Erica's husband is also an easy lay, which is why he leaves her for a younger gal. And thus we have An Unmarried Woman, an incredibly true-to-life story of a newly divorced woman just trying to get by and adjust to her new life. I wouldn't quite describe this as cinema verite, but there is a very casual, natural way to how the whole package is presented that makes you feel less like an audience member and more like a voyeur. It's tough to explain, but I like it, and I'd love to see more movies that do this. The Vanishing. In case you didn't know this already, European thrillers are horrifying. 2022's Speak No Evil was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen, and this 1988 Dutch film walks the same sinister tightrope. I've never seen a movie about a serial killer that hit as true to life as this one. Director Stanley Kubrick himself cited this as the most terrifying film he'd ever seen. And this is the guy who made The Shining, everybody. The Vanishing is going to stick with me for a long, long time. I'm still shuddering. The Wicker Man. Oh my god, this is everything I've always hoped it would be. And for the record, we're talking about the 1973 original here. Talk about cozy British folk horror. I love this. The gauzy cinematography of the time just adds to the dreamlike appeal of Summer Isle in the most wonderful hypnotic way. I didn't want this thing to end. The Wicker Man feels like the kind of movie that just doesn't get made anymore. To me, that makes it a treasure worth preserving. Even though it's set in the spring, it's a perfect September amuse-bouche to get you into the spirit of the autumn season. And if you're the kind of viewer who gets titillated by seeing a little skin, then I've got news for you, my friend. Britt Eklund bears it all, and Christopher Lee wears a kilt. Witness for the Prosecution there's nothing like a good courtroom drama, and Witness for the Prosecution kicks so much ass, it puts other courtroom dramas to shame. Deftly juggling drama and comedy without missing a beat, this film unravels a murder mystery alongside its harrowing trial. As a neat twist, the central figure of the story is the defense attorney played by Charles Lawton, who might be a contender for the most British person who has ever lived. It even has a cute little voiceover at the finale, asking audiences not to spoil the ending. Movies from this era just hit differently. We need to bring that sincerity and quaintness back, man. Extro. A man is abducted by aliens and returns three years later with a subtly changed personality. And that's about it. Extro uses its basic setup as a vehicle for its ultra-gory special effects, and those really pop when they're on screen, especially if you watch it in HD for extra stomach-churning detail. But effects notwithstanding, it's just kind of a bleak, unpleasant movie with a wafer-thin plot. The boy gets alien powers from his dad at one point, and those powers let him make a clown and a panther materialize in his apartment? These people were on some serious drugs. On the plus side, it's a cool change of pace to see a British sci-fi. It wasn't until I sat through Extro that I realized how rare that is. There's a difference between, say, is that a UFO? And, blimey, was that an alien, was it? It was a flavor I didn't even know my palate was missing. Also, huge cosmic coincidence. After Force 10 from Navarone and The Wicker Man, this is the third British film in this video where a future Bond girl does a steamy nude scene. And that's it. We have reached the end of Review Marathon 11. I've already got myself a Blu-ray of The Wicker Man because that movie was just so gosh darn wonderful I needed to put it on my shelf. And I'll probably be acquiring 
a few more of these too. The Vanishing, Witness for the Prosecution, like there's a lot of wonderful stuff in here. In terms of some plans I was thinking for the future, obviously, yes, there will be more and more and more review marathons. I have a backlog list on my phone of movies I still want to see that would fall under these umbrellas, and there's over 600 of them. So we're set for a while. I want to look back at all the ones we've done so far and maybe try to compile some kind of list. I don't know about a ranking list, but I don't know, something. Well, I want to have some fun with that. If you have anything you would like to see based on all of the previous review marathon films we've covered, let me know in the comments below. Either or, I will see you all here next time for whatever comes next here on Thumb Together. Until then, my beautiful, fabulous friends, adios.